Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vaga Maradian here at the Navy League's annual Sea Air Space Conference and Trade Show just outside Washington, D.C. in National Harbor, Maryland, where our coverage is sponsored by Fincantieri, Huntington Ingalls Industries, and Leonardo DRS. We're over at the Boeing stand now to talk to Chris Raymond, who is the Vice President for Autonomous Systems at uh, the Boeing Company, or I should say Boeing Defense, Space, and Security. Chris, it's always a pleasure. Thank you, Vago. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm going to ask you about that really, really cool full-size Echo Voyager unmanned underwater vehicle poster you guys have upstairs, All right. uh, which was uh, which was really awesome, and it, it's a tremendous capability, and I want to get to that. But first, I want to start with strategy you guys have had, sure. which has been very methodical. I think anybody who knows the history of the Boeing uh, company, as well as McDonnell Douglas, uh, knows what awesome skills, unmanned and autonomous skills, both of the companies had, uh, both in uh, operational stuff, but also in, in the theoretical realm, but you guys started with in situ was the first company that you guys bought, uh, innovative maker of unmanned uh, air system, uh, Scan Eagle, obviously very very important product line for for you guys and, and for the company. Uh, then you guys, uh, so almost every innovative company, you know, Liquid Robotics, everybody saw was uh, tremendous with the wave glider in terms of uh, you know sort of persistent sea surveillance. Uh, you guys, uh, you know, first partnered and then you acquired that company, and then last year we saw Aurora Flight Sciences another highly innovative uh, company. Uh, and then the CEO of that company then uh, ended up at Phantom Works uh, to, to lead advanced development for you guys. Talk to us a little bit about what your macro strategy is, particularly to allow these companies to operate under their own names as standalones within the larger sort of Boeing mall, if you will. Talk to us a little bit about that strategy and why it's so important to let these companies be themselves. Sure. I'll start at the Boeing level, Vago. You know, we believe autonomy is going to continue to enter our personal lives. It's going to dominate our products over time. So the ecosystem of Boeing around autonomy has grown. And I'm talking about above the BDS level now. So uh, Dennis has an enterprise team. I'm on that. Leanne asked me to be on that. But across the company, we've been looking to add our autonomous capability and leverage what we have. So I work uh, not just with Aurora, who we kept in our engineering technology and test area. I work with Horizon X. We stood up a venture arm to invest in certain technologies that will be drivers of autonomy. And then I have our defense business. And then I work with commercial airplanes and the regulatory group there as well. So we just think autonomy is going, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And when that happens, we want to be on the leading edge of introducing it and introducing it safely. Uh, and talk to us a little bit about why, you know, most of the time when any big company acquires these smaller companies, they begin to operate under the name of the big company, not under the names, and oftentimes with the same management team that they had when they were that small, sort of hungrier company. Talk to us about why it's important for these companies to operate under their own name for you. Yeah, you know, I, I had the honor of being back in 2008 when we acquired in situ. So that was one of the first companies that we uh, kept as a non-fully integrated subsidiary. That's sort of the technical term of art. But I would say it doesn't mean they're not integrated at all. It's smart integration. You know, we look for a way to bring the best of their speed and their capability, but then bring the best of our scale. And I, I think you could put Boeing's cultural change under this heading of, we want to be big and leverage everything that's good about our global bigness, but we want to have speed and agility. And sometimes, you know, we can learn a lot both ways. So where we think we're going to help them, we're also able to get good ideas from them about how we do certain things with speed. And so we've tried to do smart integration with both in situ, now Liquid Robotics, and then also most recently with Aurora. Um, you've uh, always been a key strategist in the company, uh, and uh, speed has been something that Boeing has been working toward. Um, Chris Chadwick uh, worked on that and saw that as a priority. Leanne uh, Corret, who now leads BDS, has looked at uh, BDSS, uh, looks at that also as a priority. What are some things you're learning from the companies you've acquired, but also in the research and the strategic research that you've done on this field, to try to get, to try to accelerate um, you know, it's a, it's an, Boeing's an incredible company, but it is also a big company that has built certain habits over very, very long periods of time. You know, what are some things you're learning from these smaller guys, and how are you implementing it at scale across the Boeing company? Yeah, I think some of those things, you know, Leanne stood up the autonomous group inside of defense, so we put some purpose and intentionality around that, and then that's why I have the subsidiaries, and then I work with the ones that are outside of defense. And what you learn is very good at product branding, very good at things like uh, it's okay to fail, you know, so get things out there, try them, fail. That's a big part of what Horizon X is chartered to do as well. And some of the things we've learned from Aurora, uh, you know, they would develop kits, so they had to be platform agnostic. They wanted their autonomy 
kit to be able to go on multiple fixed wing airplanes or multiple rotorcraft, for example. So just some of the autonomy technology that's coming out of those companies and then how we can apply that to our installed base of existing platforms. That's one example. You know, I think uh, John Langford, Dr. Langford at Aurora says this, but really we're in this age where the computing power and these technologies that will create autonomy, you know, analytics, artificial intelligence, machine learning, the compute power, that combined with the physical uh, architectures of platforms is really what's going to enable autonomy. So we've got to be able to operate the vehicle autonomously, but increasingly the mission systems or the thing that platform does has to also be autonomous. And so our view is we're going to be in an age where we're expanding human capability, we're introducing ways to do things more safely and augment or expand what humans can do, be they a pilot or somebody at a ground station. How do you, within Boeing though, effectively share, you know, I, I was uh, um, at, at, an, at an event and Barbara Humpton uh, of uh, Siemens said one of the big challenges Siemens as a giant German conglomerate has is, God, if we only know, knew what Siemens knows, sure. because there is so much engineering work that's happening all across the company, how do you better understand and leverage that? From your perspective, you guys have a little bit of the same challenge. How are you working within the company to make sure that the good idea, no matter where it hides, gets to the right person you share, collaborate in a good way to sort of build that idea instead of stovepiping where, well, this is my idea. Um, you know, and, and that's, you know, sometimes folks will say that's a challenge for some of the smaller companies. Sure. They've always had this, it's us against the giants mentality a little bit. And so that, that makes them a little bit, uh, you know, maybe tighter with technology sharing than they, than they might be. Talk to us about the cultural dynamic there that you guys are trying to harness. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, I think of it just like we're in the defense space, right? So why do we have a joint command? Why is there something called the purple? You know, and that's really what I have found, getting the community of people. I mean, we can have the systems that allow things to be shared, but getting the community of people, particularly now, we've got an ecosystem of autonomy in this company that we've never had before. And what we've been doing is set up a senior group at the top, which is what Dennis and Leanne have done, and then we get our CTOs and our chief engineers to make sure they know each other from the get-go. And then when we acquire a company, who you put in there as the integration manager is really important. You want to put somebody in there that knows the parent company well and will be embedded with the acquired company to really accelerate the relationships and the know-how sharing that comes across. And so that's really, it gets back to people. I mean, you can put some enabling systems in. Certainly we want people to have easy ways to communicate and all that, but really it gets to people and then setting up the sharing forums, you know, so you can get together people and riff on a new idea or say, hey, if we put these two things together, I think we could solve this operational problem. And that's what we've really learned, is get the people teams in place as quick as possible. How do you, um how do you, it's a very, very competitive space. There are a lot of companies that are trying to leverage AI uh, that have autonomous capabilities. Um, you know, who do you guys look at, you know, at the biggest competitors in this? Are you pacing it against yourself? You know, sort of who are the peer competitors you guys are out there looking at and saying, I'm judging myself against them or are you using a different sort of schema? And ultimately, what do you think differentiates what you're doing from what everybody else is doing? Yeah. You know, I think back over our, history and autonomy, you mentioned in situ, but I go back to things like the X-45. You know, we demonstrated tremendous things in Phantom Works in the X-45. The X-37, you know, longest duration space plane there's been. So we've had a lot of technology development in this area, and I think the technology might not be the thing that paces it, it may be the regulatory side of this, at least commercially. And so, you know, I think over, over time, our the traditional people that you've thought of as being in autonomy in the military and defense industry, you know, usually have gotten determined by, well, what share of a defense budget do they have? And that has tended to be more prevalent in aviation. I think what we see is, you know, the autonomy uh, capability is going to enter a lot of people's domains. We made a bet in maritime early with things like the Echo Voyager with liquid robotics because we thought the threat was changing and this cross-domain awareness idea was going to be really important in the water, not just in the air. And so I think we, you know, we will see how that plays out. There's obviously a lot of early indicators with R&D and so forth, but that was a big part of what we wanted to do. Uh, not just have aviation platforms, have maritime investments, and then in between have some of the sensor and payload capability. We're not going to ever have it all, but for us, SIGINT, acoustics processing, and imagery and full motion video are areas where we've had strength, but those sensors have to ride on things 
and then those things have to be persistent and networked, and that's really what we've tried to create. Uh, uh, the term methodical can always be applied to Boeing, uh, and so you guys, uh, you know, I'm just I'm doing some pattern recognition here. Sure. So you've got uh, in situ, and then you have Aurora, and then you have Liquid Robotics, and then there's this funny thing called the ground. So one would think that the next big thing you'd be doing. So talk to us about what the strategy is to fill out your capabilities. Um, for, for ground systems, how you guys looked at it. I mean, there are folks who may be forgetting now, but you were the future combat systems prime contractor. Uh, you know, you had a lot of key people on your team, SAIC uh, was one of them. But talk to us a little bit about how you intend to expand this franchise, because I don't think anybody looks at this as you guys are done uh, filling out this space. So talk to us about the ground component and other things in other sectors that you guys are interested in doing. Yeah, well f ground could be two things. One, we could talk about ground from a ground platform point of view. I thought you were going to go ground in terms of the operating systems. You know, this idea where we have one vehicle, one operator, you know, that's not really that much more affordable. So I think we have to reduce the cost of remote operations of these things. That's one dimension of ground. Strategies about choice, we actually have made a decision not to really play so much in the ground vehicle area. We have dabbled with that over time and we've certainly been an integrator. So if we could integrate things to make ground vehicles more autonomous, we might look at that, but we've really made a conscious choice in our, in our portfolio to play aviation and maritime first. There's a lot of money pouring into ground, and a lot of that is outside of the aerospace and defense industry and the automotive industry. So I think our view would be, you're not going to outspend what's already going on commercially. That is something we need to bring to bear and bring into defense at some point. And the fact that Boeing and General Motors co-own Hughes Research Lab, that's a place where some of that intersection occurs for us. So we've kind of made a conscious strategy on the platform side. That's probably not where we'll start. We're going to stay focused on the maritime domain awareness area, the air layer, and space. And then ground to us is how do we efficiently remotely operate things. Uh, you mentioned uh, GM Defense, uh, so this is a good segue to get to Echo Voyager, sure. uh, because um, it's an extraordinary vehicle, um, and, and, and you guys are, are making a big sort of coming out uh, in, in some ways here. Talk to us about the capability, talk to us about the retire, uh, requirement, and then talk to us also about the unique partnership you've struck with GM Defense. Sure, uh, on the Echo Voyager, uh, probably five, eight years ago, we launched that because we saw a few things taking place. We thought there could be a commercial use for it, but we knew that in defense and security, we saw it as a way to augment the manned submarines around the world, not that we're going to replace them. We saw this as a way to go into the areas where you might not want to put humans in jeopardy, you may have access problems, but the big step was endurance and payload and to rid yourself of being host ship dependent. And so that brings cost, that brings uh, a lot of people noticing things. So our view was if we could figure that out with the right sized truck, then the payload roadmap will come. And at the end of the day, it's a truck. That truck has a lot of endurance, it has a lot of great payload capability, and it's got a lot of depth to it that can uh, be helpful. But the payload roadmap is what's going to set it apart and allow the operational value of that to come to pass. So we've been developing the truck, we were in the water last year with the Alpha Trials out in uh, Southern California. Uh, we're competing for the ORCA program. We understand Echo Voyager does not equal ORCA. The Navy has its own ORCA set of requirements for that. But Echo Voyager has been our way to try to mature the technology and uh, try to lead some of that payload development. And uh, we're looking forward to get back in the water uh, here soon. We'll be back in Southern California. We're going to operate out of the Long Beach Alta Sea port. And uh, we'll get back in the water for Bravo Trials. And uh, it is a very impressively sized vehicle. I mean, it's 51 feet long. So, I mean, don't let this model deceive you. When you see it up on a wall, it is quite a lot of, uh, of, of payload capability. It is, and what we were, the balance we were trying to strike there is um, the range and endurance and the payload cap uh, capability. And so when we started, we had a certain payload size in mind. I think as we've iterated over the last couple of years, we determined that payload bay needed to grow a little bit. We're at about 34 feet. Uh, with about eight and a half feet on the sides. So a lot of volume with the idea of sort of a universal interface in there for the payload roadmap that will come and depending on the mission that has to be conducted. And, and if you look at it, I mean, with that kind of a bay, 
you're also then using some unmanned payloads yourself in order to be able to prosecute certain complex missions. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, you can your, your mind can wander to some of the things people have done. Some of those have been made public in terms of, you know, whether you're uh, using it to position things that you'll eject or actually just use it with passive payloads. But, you know, all of that we see as potential for the future. And I think what we're looking to do is first stay focused on the Navy's ORCA requirement and then stay focused on mission, utility, and operational value. That will dictate the payloads, and we need to build out that payload roadmap with the Navy. Uh, and talk to us about the partnership with General Motors, because I think that folks think of General Motors as an automotive company. Full, full disclosure, they sponsored us at uh, AUSA last year. Um, uh, but, you know, the company has been working very, very aggressively in military power writ large, whether it's for surface uh, uh, vehicle applications, um, you know, unmanned vehicle applications, uh, where the company un un unveiled its sort of um, Pa uh, uh, unmanned uh, flatbed uh, that could be used for a whole variety of uh, unmanned autonomous uh, flatbed that was fuel cell powered. And they also produce the fuel cells that are in the Echo Voyager. And you also talked about uh, the, the sort of technology partnership you guys have. Talk to us a little bit about what you guys are doing with GM and how you guys are operating on a virtuous cycle on that. Yeah, with GM, where my world really intersects theirs is really through Hughes Research Lab. So that's part of Boeing's engineering and technology portfolio. We share half of the Hughes Research Lab with GM. So that's really where that Boeing partnership comes in. And, you know, so it's early stage research. So what Hughes Research Lab has been very good at is either through their own R&D initiatives or through sponsored research of one of the parent companies, we work on the early stage things. So this is where a lot of work's going on in perceptual learning, uh, artificial intelligence, the kind of compute systems that you need to really put on mobile platforms that are going to allow it to learn over time. And I think some of that's occurring faster in the automotive industry just because they've had more time to train the vehicles and the brains that sit in those vehicles for autonomy. But that's really where the GM partnership comes from. And then I've, I've also, on Echo Voyager, we've struck a partnership with uh, Huntington Ingalls. And so that's, a, that's been another great thing, to bring a lot of their know-how to our Echo Voyager pursuit. And uh, full disclosure, Huntington Ingalls is one of our sponsors as well uh, here at uh, Sunny Navy League. Um, am I mistaken on fuel cells? Are they GM fuel cells that are powering uh, the Echo Voyager? We've looked at, I, I don't want to disclose that because we've worked with a lot of different people okay. on fuel cells, and I think that is an area, though, Vago, where you're spot on. I mean, the power density is just continuing to improve. All platforms, be they in the air or under the water, are going to want to have more power, and I think uh, Aurora has done a lot of work in battery technology as well. And so this idea of power density and giving the platform more kilowatts to spend on the payload, not just operating itself, is something we'll just continue to, to drive. That's an important technology. Um, let me take you to MQ-25, even though I know that this sure. is a high priority for the Navy for the unmanned refueling uh, aircraft. Uh, a lot of competition. Every single one of the companies has their uh, big models, whether it's the guys at Lockheed, uh, whether it's the guys at General Atomics, and obviously you guys are big players in that uh, as well. Um, talk to us as much as you can about the program. It's a challenging requirement. It's a fully autonomous uh, tanker uh, aircraft, which is what uh, the Navy wants. Some discussion also to put payload uh, modules on that to be able to give it uh, a SIGINT or ISR capabilities uh, as well. Talk to us about the program and what you think you guys are, are bringing to the party. Yeah, well, like we kind of said, it's a competitive phase, so I probably won't say a lot. I'll just say, Boeing's very focused on winning this program. You know, it's an important mission. We've been proud and honored to be with the Navy on carriers, you know, since our inception almost. And so this thing has been a program we've followed and loved for probably coming close to eight or nine years now, if not a decade, back in its earliest instantiations of U-Class. I can tell you our whole corporations are very focused on it. We want to satisfy the Navy and win that as a prime. And I don't think I'm going to get you to say much more than that. That's probably true. <laughs> you know, you've, you've been in this space for a very long time. Uh, not dating you, uh, you're, you still look lovely. But, uh, you know, you've been in this business for a long time and everybody is talking about greater agility. Are you seeing that as, as somebody who leads, uh, and particularly about agility, about innovation? And you found yourself time and again in your career, you know, you know as a strategist, uh, operating in the business space, uh, but also like trying to push innovative solutions. Do you see a difference? Do you, do, you know, is this, is this a rhetorical thing that we're seeing from everywhere? 
everyone, or, or are you actually seeing a change in, in agility from your standpoint? I think I'm seeing a change. You know, I think there is a lot more focus on innovation. We've all tried different things to get it into our ecosystems faster. You know, I would argue DIUX, some of the things that uh, then Secretary Carter did to try to stand up. These are all things to try to get access to innovation. And a term of art we like to use is bring the outside in. No matter how innovative we think we are, for some of these technologies, and certainly the ones that are driving autonomy, a lot of that is happening outside of the aerospace field. It's one of the reasons that our Horizon X Ventures team invests in certain areas. It's one of the reasons we like Aurora. We have to bring the outside in and, and learn from some of these technologies and then figure out how to apply them to the military world where we have to certify things a certain way, we have to operate things a certain way. But I really think we're all striving to bring that innovation in differently than we have in the past. And then we have to not let the rules kind of get in the way. And by that I mean, I think, you know, rules around what's a commercial item, rules around intellectual property and data rights. These are the things we have to sort our way through to fully sort of take advantage of all this money and R&D investment occurring outside of aerospace and then apply it inside of aerospace. That's the way I look at it. So I, I do see a change, you know, and I think I see cultural change as well. Uh, just look at the people that are in the acquisition community right now and the backgrounds that they have, Secretary Gertz or uh, Secretary Roper or uh, Secretary Lord. You know, these are people that have a lot of industrial background and they are trying to make things go faster. And some of that is really the regulations and some of that is just the culture of decision making that they're trying to spur forward. So I see a change. Um, and you, you mentioned Horizon X, which is your Silicon Valley, you know, part of your venture investment sure. uh, setup you guys have. Um, where do you see investing your next dollar? You know, you talked about land, so it's kind of a follow-up on that question, where you're going to sort of hold off there. Do you see more? Of, do you see more investment in companies like this uh, that are on the air and and sea side? Yeah, you know, I think what Horizon X's uh, model was, the reason we wanted that, you can get a lot of early stage relationship and a lot of learning. Back to my point, bring the outside in. So one of their responsibilities is we have a roadmap, I won't disclose them all, but we have a roadmap of technologies we're interested in. And so where we can find early stage companies and get that investing and a technical relationship going early, that's what we want to do. And you've seen, you know, almost 10 announcements by Horizon X just in 14 months or so. And so that's a big part of it. But we also ask them to play another role, which is when there's a partnership that needs to be done with what I'll call a non-traditional, meaning it doesn't fall purely in Boeing commercial airplane space, doesn't fall purely in my defense space, but something we still want to pursue for a little while, we let Horizon X lead that. And that's one of the reasons we kept Aurora positioned in the corporation where we did, is we want them to be free to run at commercial speed, uh, and to go either a find fast, fail fast if necessary, and get that innovation uh, iteration going faster. And so that's how I uh, leverage that. And then when they mature something, it's my job to work in the joint team and bring it into defense. Chris, pleasure as always, sir. Thanks very much, and looking See forward you. to staying in touch, uh, especially over the course of this show as developments present themselves. Great, thanks, Vago. Appreciate your time, always good to see you.